Well, hello. My charge is to talk about cataract surgery and the abnormal cornea. These are my financial disclosures, and I'll make sure that nothing impacts the subject matter of my talk. Now, for this discussion, we're going to stick with the most commonly encountered forms of corneal disease, like keratoconus, Fuchs dystrophy, and we're going to lump together things like corneal transplants and radial keratotomy. So let's get started with keratoconus. Now, here's a patient of mine with both keratoconus and a significant cataract, and the major topics here are are the lens changes visually significant? How do I calculate lens power? How do I manage the astigmatism? And do I need to combine this with a corneal transplant? So let's talk about the termination of clinically significant lens changes because there's so much overlap with difficulty reading, glare, reduced uh, vision. And the first thing is make sure that the topography is stable. If the cornea is not stable, you gotta consider at least collagen cross-linking so you can get stable keratometry. And don't forget about the RGP refraction. This is an essential test placing a gas perm lens on the cornea, and it helps us determine whether the visual changes are due to corneal disease or disease elsewhere. Here in this patient, the R RGP is going to reduce the astigmatism, give good vision. But a patient like this with corneal scarring, it probably isn't, so we have to look elsewhere. Now, calculation of lens power is always a challenge with keratoconus, and that's because of the irregular astigmatism. The problem here is that all of the biometers tend to overestimate the power of the cornea because the central cornea is so steep and then tends to become uh, flatter in the periphery. So we underestimate the power of the IOL, leaving our patients hyperopic. And it doesn't matter how fancy your biometer is, whether it's an IOL Master or a Pentacam AXL or some of the other more advanced keratometers, they all mess things up. Now, luckily, we have some new formulas and things like the Kane formula, Barrett True K, and Barrett True K for keratoconus have made calculation of lens power easier and made additional implants like Toric IOL safer. But don't forget, you have to use the keratoconus version of the formula. Here's the Kane for keratoconus, and this is the Barrett True K formula for keratoconus. You got to make sure you put it in keratoconus mode or you're not going to get the right IOL implant. Now, in the OR, what do you have to watch out for? While well, you've got very thin corneas, they might not seal up as well, the apical scarring, and very deep anterior chambers. And just look at this pentacam, look at how thin that peripheral cornea is. If you make an incision through that thin area, it may never close. So you'll have to consider doing a superior approach, maybe a supratemporal, or even go back to a near clear or scleral tunnel. Visualization of the red reflex can be challenging because of the irregular cornea, and using things like viscoelastic on the cornea can help certainly using stains, and some people have even put gas perm lenses on. So now that you're taking out the cataract, you've got to put an implant in. A lot of the studies will show that patients with stable refractions can use toric IOLs, and now we're experimenting, experimenting with small aperture IOLs. Now on a rare occasion, the cornea is to blame, or is at least in part to blame, and that's where you're going to have to move on and do a triple procedure where you might need to do a corneal transplant and cataract surgery all at the same time. We really do try and stay away from these if possible. Next up is Fuchs dystrophy, another common corneal dystrophy. Here we have these guttata, and the key is recognition so you can do proper patient counseling, make sure you, they know they may have a slower recovery of vision with cataract surgery, get the right IOL and the right IOL calculation in there. Our history here is that diurnal variation glare and halo, similar to cataract, but a little bit different. And of course, you'll see the guttata and corneal swelling on exam. What I like to use is the 24% risk of PBK in a cell count less than 1,000. So when I'm looking at cell counts and I see less than 1,000, I start nudging the patient maybe towards a triple versus encouraging cataract surgery alone. So the question here is, does surgical technique matter? Can we impact things? And I think the answer is yes. And anything that seems to save endothelium is probably a good idea. So repeated placement of OVD, the soft shell technique, trying to keep the flow relatively low because high flow situations also damage endothelium. But, and of course, trying to keep the CDE low can be helpful. So here's the magic of the femtosecond laser. Can we use technology to the rescue? And the answer is maybe. There are some pretty good publications showing less energy with femtosecond and saving of the endothelial cells. And then non phaco type procedures. Here we're using endocapsular nuclear disassembly. And if it reduces your CDE, there probably is some benefit. So here's just a quick example of somebody with Fuchs who may need surgery. They're gonna have symptoms like glare, halo, difficult to tell if it's cataract versus Fuchs, the cell counts low and the pachymetry is not terrible. And we'll say here our cell counts right around 1100. 
This is a patient who I think you have to at least to talk about endothelial keratoplasty, but you can encourage cataract surgery alone. In a case like this, you're definitely going to want to encourage them to see a corneal specialist, target mild myopia, and warn them that things may take longer to heal. And what about multifocal IOLs? Can you place a multifocal or presbyopia correcting IOL? Well, the answer is you can put a multifocal on anybody, but you might not have a happy patient. But especially a non-diffractive EDOF seems to do at least okay in patients with Fuchs dystrophy. It's not as good as a healthy cornea, but it can be done. And here's a patient of mine with mild Fuchs and a cornea. And this paper sums it up well. You've got to be careful in these patients. You've got to do a good exam, warn them about corneal edema, and be very, very careful with their surgery. Last few minutes, let's talk about the surgically irregular cornea, corneal transplants, and radial keratotomy. Some of the most challenging cases out there. Now here you see we're making our incision between the RK marks. And the challenges with RK is the unstable cornea causing diurnal variation. You may not get good, good keratometry and during surgery you definitely don't want to uh, interrupt those RK incisions. They are very very difficult to close. We get lots of referrals for collagen cross-linking but it doesn't really seem to do that much so I'm not sure it's the answer that we're looking for. So it's all in the technique. We've already talked about missing the RK scars. And when it comes to corneal transplants, it's all about the graft host junction. Make sure there's enough room. Here, there's almost no room for a clear corneal incision. We're going to have to move back into a scleral tunnel. Second example has more room for a clear corneal wound. You also have to worry about the cell counts. A healthy cornea means probably a good surgery. An older cornea with a low cell count, likely to fail and need a repeat surgery. And almost a quarter of patients, even with clear corneas, uh, will fail after surgery. So again, just like in Fuchs dystrophy, lots of OVD. And make sure you get those sutures out. Just watch this topography change shape as we remove the sutures. So make sure those sutures are out before you do the surgery. And again, the implant will depend on the shape of the cornea. Repeat the biometry multiple times, make sure it's stable. And we are experimenting now with small aperture optics, even in somebody with an irregularly shaped cornea. You can see the astigmatism here, doing well with uncorrected vision of 20-30. That's all the time I have. Thank you so much for your attention.